I'll introduce Ed, Ed Riley shortly, but just a, a bit of background and my experience working with Ed on, on uh, <coughs> presenting and winning as, he, as he's talking today. So I've worked with Ed on a number of occasions uh, in some ma major projects, major bids, so uh, with organisations such as TEAST coming up with winning strategies and uh, developing teams to present to clients uh, for, you know, to, to put our best foot forward. And Ed's helped me form alliance teams and, and uh, set people up to, to uh, you know, go with their strengths and present. So I'm sure Ed today will, will um, you know, be a very uh, enjoyable, interactive session where he'll, he'll work through that with you. So, um, <coughs> excuse the cough. So in, enjoy, enjoy the session and... Why did, I, um, why did I show you that? Yeah, I could have written up on the whiteboard, wear a seatbelt. Yeah, it was, yeah, absolutely. All, all sensory, but not a word. Right? Could they have shown you um, the same with the guy going head, and, head, and, you know, head first through the windscreen? Right? That was a constructive, a constructive message, wasn't it? Is there a clear call to act? What is it? Wear your seatbelt, right? Why the wife and the daughter? Right? Without being critical, one of the things that I have, I've seen um, some extracts from your submissions. What have I seen, Marin? The one pages, the extract for the, for the, the dinner? Um, emotion. Not a lot. So if I had one message or suggestion or encouragement for you out of the session today and over your week, the work between now and the next week, um, I would encourage you to think about the thing that makes most of you folks different to me. And that is, I am not an overcastrian. Love to be, but poor lineage, right? But most of you folks, whether you've adopted this city or you're born and bred and raised here, what you're working on here is actually gonna make a, a bloody big difference to this city and to the future that you guys are building. So when, and you'll hear people will say, you know, you drive, a, 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 the ad industry will talk about driving a truck through the heart. And if you've ever been on a bid anywhere where a crap proposition has got up and it happens like every day, why did it get up? It got up because someone appealed to a set of emotional drivers better than you did. So you'll hear it's not always the best proposition if that makes sense. So as you work on it, and if you've done some work on your presentation so far, awesome. I guess my hope and my focus today is to help you get the drivers in there that are going to appeal to the people that are judging it. And the people that are judging it are as follows. Arguably, who is your end customer? Who do you reckon your end customer of this proposition is? People of Newcastle? Judges? Both? It's, it's, pretty much, it's pretty much you folks. Does that make sense? So as I say, if you think about it, just think about what it's going to mean, you know, the, the WIFM thing. What is that going to mean to you folks, if that makes sense? So my, there's plenty of structure to come, um, but as I've said to each of you, your teams individually, I'm actually going to run today a bit like a tutorial. So I'm going to step through a piece and then I've got it on an A3 and I'm going to say, okay guys, 10 minutes. And if you've already done it, if your presentation is at that point that it's advanced, you sit there and you go, well, that relates to sections one, two, three. Done. 
and we'll move on. Okay, but what I want to do is just make it very contextually clear so it, it helps you take the document you lodged and turn that into a great presentation. Okay, um, simplifying presentations, there's only two parts to it. There's the message and there's the delivery. So today I'm going to help you structure on the message and then through your rehearsal piece and the stuff we do next week, we'll work on the delivery. So I'm not going to talk to you today about gestures, eye contact, any of the delivery skills. Just going to work on structuring the message. Okay? Quick questions or comments, otherwise we'll start moving. Okay, you've got a document in there. I'm going to step you through that in a couple of pieces. Um, this is a straight download, so let me just spend a few minutes on each of these. So if you look at that first page, uh, beyond the agenda, what makes, what makes a successful presentation or communication? Um, if you think about effective, if you think and make notes as you like or not, just listen to the oracle, go for your life. If you think about effect, think about cause and effect, the principle of cause and effect. If you're trying to affect people, then give them a reason or a cause. You need to connect with them. The other side of it is, um, is, is to make a difference. So what are we trying, what change or what effect are we trying to impose upon these people? What are we trying to encourage them to do? Um, effective communications and exchange. So when you're standing up there as a team, how do you interact with the five panellists in front of you? They're not a, a single unit of judges. They are five individuals, all with different perspectives, or will have read the documents differently and interpreted them differently. There may be some elements in common, but the job there is to exchange information with them. You aren't likely to get much in the way of verbal back from them during the presentation. They will behave. They know that you probably have planned to speak for 30 odd minutes. They're not going to interrupt you. They're going to be polite. So how are you going to get information back from them if they're not talking? Emotional engagement, right? Do they look like they're interested? You guys know your, your presenting sequence, correct? Who's, who's presenting last? Awesome. Who's presenting first? So what's... Infiltrator? Oh, you mean... Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. Yes. So, so the point is, what is the difference between first and last? You've all interviewed for jobs, correct? First in, last in. Is there a dead rubber in the middle? Right? So what it, so, so, yeah. so how, are you going, how are you going to change the gig to get their attention? Don't tell me. Don't answer. Keep it to yourself. Right? And similarly for the last. So all of those things, how are you going to exchange? Um, quick exercise. Ideas, energy and actions. We're communicating words. Put your form a circle with your thumb and your forefinger. Quick, quick exercise. Put it, ready? Everyone got one? Re speed. Want you to put that on your chin. Go. These are the most non conforming group I think I've ever seen. <laughs> Why did I say chin? I don't know. Why did I put it on my cheek? What happened? Disconnect between the verbal and the visual, yeah? So if you say, I'm really, really pleased to be here, look it. Does that make sense? I know you may be tired. I know this has been a long program. I know you've been working hard on the document, yada, yada, yada. Right? If you are going to be conveying, people will walk away remembering the integrity of the message, the, the business case strength, all that stuff. But did you or did you not look like you wanted to be there? People buy passion. Does that make sense? Um, on to the understanding. You're actually dealing, by nature of the brief, you're dealing with stuff which for some folks, my generation is fairly alien. The whole idea of apps and technology. What's not alien though, is urban renewal, development, all of those sorts of things. So think about how you relate and make easy to understand for your audience. The old adage you might have heard, seek first to understand. Understand your judges, your audience. Um, be clear about your purpose. Your presentation purpose on the day is different to the purpose of your document. Does that make sense? Should be aligned, absolutely. But the purpose on the day will be different. Pretty hard to make a document emotionally engaging. Um, 
Effective communication or presenting is a relationship between two people. So whomever is speaking needs to engage individually each of the five judges. As I said, the judges are not anonymous, they're not a single cell. You'll have influences, but you need to be able to appeal to them directly. And lastly, um, you folks will understand my technical capabilities. And, and it was a good example of awareness. When, when I, was, I could hear the music, I go, that's great, that's cool. And you guys are all sitting there sniggering away, right? But did it bother me? Not really, but I, did I go about trying to fix it pretty quickly? So if you've got a judge on the day disengaged or can't see, they keep clearing their glasses. They're struggling to see around a pillar. We had a, a room last year that was not well laid out and had a pillar in it. And, you know, so stop, address, rectify. Does that make sense? Because at the very least it shows intent and courtesy. Okay. Um, Yeah, over the next page, let me get you to dive through the planning piece. Um, and then I'll, I'll get onto the slides, which will build this, the next couple of pieces pretty quickly. Okay, the planning model. Really, really simple. This is your logic. So you may already have made a whole bunch of work um, on your presentation. But if you haven't, I'd suggest that you need to do some work on researching your audience. Your audience in this instance on the day for the presentation are the five judges. So dig into their profile. These days there's truckloads of information available on these people. Their background, you'll be able to tell from the companies they've worked with what sort of information they're go is going to appeal to them. If you use the wrong type of examples, we'll talk about persuasion, it will go in one ear and out the other. If you want to turn me to sleep, start giving me lots of stats. Right, it's just the way I work. For, thankfully, I'm not on the panel. So if you think, really want to be understood and you want to connect with them and you want to exchange information with them, uh, and one of the, the second thing we're going to construct at the moment is thinking about what are their needs, what are the judges' needs. Um, have a, a very, very clear, what's the purpose or the express purpose of your presentation? It's the objective for you, but it's also the objective for them. The judges are sitting there, why are they sitting there? What do they want from this presentation? Put yourself in their shoes. Um, persuasion. You'll find that people, you know, I use that video clip because it really aptly starts to, to express the whole emotional connection piece. Think about m most of the work that goes on in this city. There's not a lot, of, there would be some ad agencies, but it's not a, what you would call a super creative town. There's really, really good research, technical, mechanical DNA. That's what you folks are as a generalisation. Is that fair? No. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but as it, and it's probably fair to say that it's shifting. But I, I would suggest to you that if you think about persuasion, we can actually you know, think about the way we're going to be able to con, uh, communicate and persuade people. Um, on the structure, most particularly teams, some of you will have decided that one person's going to present by themselves. I know, I've got the word on the street, I understand that. There are others that will have decided that everyone's going to present. That's a decision. That's, do you have to? I have to, it's part of the brief. I guess the point is, how the heck do you coordinate five people? So how do you do that so that it looks like you've got half a hope of being able to run a business? Because if you can't present cohesively, you're not a team and you can't run a business, correct? Not really, but that's the way it looks like. On to visuals. It's step five. Um, and take clue from me, keep your visuals uncomplicated. You guys will be better, invariably better at them than me. Um, and take a backup. Um, most people, you see it on the plane. You see people sitting there <coughs> punching out a presentation using PowerPoint. It's a good planning tool. Um, but don't confuse all of that stuff with visuals. Um, read through, proof it from the perspective of the audience. What am I trying, what are my drivers for the audience and what's my objective? Um, rehearsal, uh, I've had plenty of instances where growing ups that have paid a lot of money just simply refuse to rehearse. You have a choice, rehearse or experiment on the day. It's up to you. Um, delivery, there's seven steps before that, right? It's all about preparation. Um, and the last one is the, the debrief piece. 
kind of interesting for you folks because you might argue you're not in an ongoing business. But from a leadership standpoint, um, you should actually have a really good clean look in the mirror with yourselves because you've been on a journey. And if you can't be honest with yourselves about something theoretical like this, then you probably, probably haven't picked up that much over the last eight months. So take the time, and it doesn't need to be long, but take the time to sit down and go, we did all that work because that's the business, that's the business transferal skill for you folks. Because people want to walk away, and in business they say, and even client suppliers, they say, no, no, you did really well. You didn't come first, but you did really well. And they won't be straight up with you about what you didn't do. And it's rubbish. It's absolute rubbish. I don't get, you don't go back to clients like that. Because you've just put up a lot of your free time, haven't you? Think about it. They don't give you the decency of a straight up answer so that you can improve your offer next time around. Don't do business with them, they're idiots. That's why I'm not in any government panels. Right? But, I mean, but we, every time we go and bid, we just feed the machine, don't we? Calculate the GDP loss as a country on that sort of stuff. Times five companies. Go and design and build free dwellings for people that need them in Ghana. Do something useful. So I guess my point is, it's all part of that learning process. So head to tail, um, and I've got the, the detailed data that I'll email through to you. Quick questions. I'm just going to keep moving pretty quickly because I want to get on to the tutorial page. So what we're going to do is dive through those. Um, it's, there's two parts to the audience piece I'm going to uh, get you to run through with. Um, persuasion and then structure. The, there's two of those and then to each of those. Let me keep moving, folks. Okay, over the next page. Audience, um, audience styles. Is that what you got? Yep. Okay. How many of you at some point have done a psychometric test? Disc, Myers, Briggs, spin, some of that sort of stuff. Yep. The whole point about that is not everybody's the same. So let me just dive you through this. Okay. So I've titled it client styles here. But the whole idea is, in this instance, we plot two dynamics. So if you, if you think about it in a business context, your behaviour is a function of environment and your DNA. Hard DNA, soft DNA. So your hard DNA is the, the output of, of your parents. Your soft DNA is how you were raised at home, the values, the behaviours, and all sorts of stuff that were drilled into you. So change your environment. So if we think about business, are you someone that has got to get their way all the time? Or conversely, are you pretty easy going? All right, you could argue that they're opposites. On the horizontal, are you highly controlled, disciplined? Or conversely, are you all over the shop? Okay, so just think about those two. So plotting yourself on either of those continuums. So what happens is when you start to find that you, so let's say you are plotted there and there, so reasonably highly dominant and moderately spontaneous, that will put you in that quadrant. So we term that quadrant expressive. This quadrant, spontaneous and easygoing, is amiable. The easygoing and the controller is analytical, and the dominant and the controller is the driver. So what we're going to do now is just look at some of the attributes of the individual. Is everyone with me? They're fairly impatient, short on time, like questions to be answered yes, no, don't want much detail. Um, use insta instinct or gut a fair bit to make decisions and are pretty process light. Generalisations, but they're the sorts of individuals we've got. You will find those folks in lots of roles. However, line of accountability, CEO, lead, very, very typical. Very often seen as being reasonably um, disinterested in people, impersonal, very focused and object driven. Um, the expressive. Um, opinionated, unpredictable, verbal, colourful, they lead, not follow, and they're flamboyant. Any of your, your expert critics, you know, think about anybody that's a publicity hound that is, is an opinion, you know, whose opinion is sought out. And the, we're going to talk in a minute about how you work with these folks and how you address them. So what I'm suggesting in a minute is that you're going to sit down and with whatever you do or don't know about the judges, try and make an assessment of how you need to deliver information to them to get them understanding what you're saying. So as I say, people like, like them or not, 
Ken Doan, Ian Kiernan, um, yeah, any of the broadcasters, Alan Jones, Darren Hinch, any of these people. Edmund Capon that runs the, um, the Art Gallery in New South Wales. Um, I don't know the identities. There'd have to be a couple of people up here. Is anybody brave enough to give me a name? No. <laughs> um, okay, on to the analytic. Um, very, very typical, your engineering piece. You know, engineering, accounting, anybody that's got really good diagnostic process, problem solving, would relate, I would think, to quite a number of you folks in the room. Logic, explore options, get into the detail, do your homework, research, scenario testing, multi-criteria analysis, all that sort of stuff. Um, generally much more productive and very, very timeline driven um, and work just about always with the facts rather than the emotions. Does that make sense? Anybody resonate? Don't put your hand up. Okay. Um, <laughs> the tea lady. Have you ever been inside an organisation where there's someone that just seems to be so disinterested or detached from the whole business piece and it's about the people and what's going on, who's had a birthday, who's just been on holidays. I mean, literally in the, the era when I started work, they still had tea ladies. And the accountants got hold of them and decided you could outsource it to somewhere and that a machine was way better. What they lost was the social glue. Does that make sense? Has everybody got a what I call Aunt Martha in their business? Because if you don't, you need to go and find one. Aunt Martha is the person that walks around and makes sure that people aren't getting shoved under the bus. Does that make sense? They know who's got an uncle or an aunt that's got dementia or who they're after, they're caring. Don't confuse them with HR. <laughs> at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> what was that? HR does not make no. um, Talks doesn't make decisions, always. Right, you think about these decision makers, often up here. But don't underestimate the influence Anybody, we've got any pu pu we'll get public sector. IRTC is not public sector, it's cutting hot, wide edge efficiency, John, isn't it? But if you think about it, the amiables exist in lots of government entities. Right? They, the trouble with these folks is they all appear to be all over the shop, but when you challenge them, they, they're, they're not actually prepared to, to, to fight it. So it, makes, it actually makes them quite difficult to work with, not intentionally. They're the sorts of people who've been off on a lifelong holiday, they've been planning for six weeks and they, they come back and you come up and talk to them about the last board meeting or the project requirements for tomorrow because you haven't asked them about their holiday. Does that make sense? With these people, do not, do not, just do not overlook them because they are really, really easy allies if you treat them with respect. But you've got to engage them. Does that make sense? So the whole idea is, let's just think about these guys. How would you present information to the driver? Get to the point. Yep. Many examples or just one or two? One. one. <laughs> Maybe, here's my recommendation, here's the outcome, here's the decision you make and you need to make. Keep it really, really simple. Any of you ever worked for someone that just wants a one-page synopsis of just about everything? Right, that gives you a pretty good clue. Um, the other side of it is, what do you reckon is going to give those people the irrits? What's going to give a driver the irrits? Dribbling. Dribbling, meandering, no preparation, not being prepared to back yourself. Does that make sense? So when you turn up, do your homework, be on point, get in, get out, give them an example and move on. Okay, over to the expressive. How do you, how do you actually engage uh, if you need to get them to improve or endorse something? Make it interesting. Make it interesting? Yep. Bang. Engage them. People, lots of organisations go, oh, you can never control Fred. Yes, you can. Go and sit down with Fred and make sure that his opinion matters. And without patronising, you might say, look, you know, one of the things that we've done you know, in this process was I spent a little bit of time chatting with Cara about some of the research he's been doing in this area. Everybody in the room knows that I've just worked Cara over. But she's happy. She's got her, seriously, she's got her fingerprints on it. And if that's what matters, give it to her. It's not that hard. But you ignore those people at their peril because they will hijack the agenda and you will get nothing. Make sense? Okay, down to the amiable. 
start with holiday shots. No, but, but very, strong, very strong people piece. Does that make sense? Very strong human or people piece. Um, and lastly, the analytic. Facts, what was the process we chose? What was the variety of the outcomes? What did our sensitivity analysis tell us? What are the, what are the uh, our, under the criteria, what are our rank preferences? And in, if you think about deductive inductive logic, What's the proposition and let him, them disprove it? What is the business problem? How'd you go about it? And what were the outcomes? And hence, what's a recommendation? Does that make sense? So, what I'd like you to do, does any, has anybody done any research on the judges that they're not, not happy to share? What I want you to do, when I give you the sheet, is just plot it's a blank. Plot your five judges. This is for you guys to keep. You're not handing in, this is a work session. Five minute work session. Plot the judges. So I'm gonna take, it seems like you're all on the same level playing field. Five judges, five judges in case you missed the, me the memo. Tony Cade, CEO of Hunternet. Um, ex, ex Violia. Um, and no, long term Novocastrian from memory. Um, Nilla Burrows runs 1805. Um, I think was on the HMRI board, or involved with HMRI. Uh, Ganilla has been around some of these events. Anna Zicky, who's a coordinator general for uh, transport for, New South, uh, for uh, Newcastle. Uh, Long-term RMS, like 20-year veteran. Tough, smart, resilient, strong woman. Read my lips. Um, Henny Duploy, who runs PWCS. Um, and was, was Jonathan Vanderbilt from ARTC, but is Wayne Johnson. Uh, and Wayne, in some ways, don't, you don't need to talk here, um, John, but Wayne is perhaps in some ways quite non-ARTC. He's, he's a long-term at ARTC, it's fair to say, John? Wayne? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so okay, so not, not long-term, but he's also not typical. He's, he's got a bit of, bit of spark, got a bit of spark to him. Yeah, sat, sat, at a, sat at a dinner with me and I didn't think he was from ARTC, I was so confused. Yep, White Haven Cop. Yep. So the whole idea, whole idea, guys, is if you if you think what I'm going to do is we, I think the five minutes has elapsed. What I'm observing for you on your behalf is you need to do a pardon the French shitload more research on those people. Mm -hmm. They're all on LinkedIn. You're about to tell just basic stuff. The university degree they studied, where they studied it. Right, simple stuff like that. The organisation. You don't need to stalk them on LinkedIn, but two degrees of separation in this city, somebody will know them well. Hopefully they're not on the other team. But find out, the, the th if you had three questions, what is it that gives those people, pardon the French, the shits? Mm -hmm. what, what are they like as a, a colleague or a, an employer? And what do they do out of their business hours? Are they madly involved in surf life saving, mountaineering, flying planes? They've all, these, all of these people, and it goes back to the Olympics pitch, remember the little kid, right? Tanya Blanco, um, it was all about the, the typical profile of the IOC judges. They were 70 year olds that drank red wine and loved being grandparents. So what would you include in your presentation? Include kids. Does that make sense? So you need to do some research and you're gonna be researching what I'm about to go into now, okay? Okay, any, any quick questions before I move on from that? You, you get the drift? You need to understand these individuals. Okay. My first 15 years of my career was selling, building materials. Exciting, but I had to start somewhere. Um, I'd been selling for 15 years and I saw this and I, the world started to make a bit more sense to me, which is kind of a good thing. So if you think about, just forget business. Why do you choose to live in the postcode you do? Why do you wear a $500 watch? Why do you go and love going to restaurants where it's 150 bucks a head or not? So the whole idea is why do you make choice A over B in any instance? So the whole idea is that we make them for a composite set of reasons. On the left are the rational. They're matters of the head. They're objective. Any two people will look at that and say, yes or no, it does or doesn't represent A, B or C. So some of the rational drivers. Is it 
size A, B or C? Is it within the time frames that uh, it's required? Um, is it colour blue? Um, lifespan, duration, specifications, capacity, warranty, certified, reliability, fits criteria, price and location. Let's go back to reliability. Is reliability hard or soft? I would think that most O&Ms, op operators and maintainers in this business here, would, they would see reliability as a very tangible thing. They talk about reliability availability, right, in the rolling stock business, John? Correct? Yep, yep. <laughs> Some would look at something and say, that's not bloody reliable. That's almost emotional, isn't it? Does that make sense? But all of those things there are logical and would just about always occur in an RFP or something. So what we're going to do in a minute is have a think about what are the rational needs or aspirations of the judges when they look at your response to the brief. One of them is going to be the word value. How have you increased the value of you know, Newcastle as an example? So they're all fairly logical. Then go across to the emotional, matters of the heart. What's the image of that individual? How's it going to make me look? How does it make me feel about myself in terms of esteem? Do I like the style? Style's completely subjective, isn't it? Right, so this is all the subjective stuff. The opinion of my wife, my girlfriend, my husband, my, my partner. I might not agree with that, but if it's their opinion, I'm probably going to give it some weight, correct? Um, is, it a, you know, is it a nice salesperson? Um, is it a good suburb? Postcodes are thoroughly irrational. Are they not? Just for one digit. Right, I don't know what the analogy is here. Was it Waratah? Broadmeadow, difference between Waratah, oh, no, nah, Islington, give me a break. <laughs> Islington, you could be one, yeah, but the other side of Maitland Road, and it was a 50 grand more expensive. Am I on the money there? So you look at that and you go, then the location, appearance, fear, these two, fear, greed, ambition in business, right? A lot of people are driven by Fear and ambition. How is this going to make me look and how is that going to improve my capacity to get the next job I'm after? Sounds really cynical, but it's real. Let's finish with the last one. This is, I get myself in all sorts of trouble and I go, look at this stuff. Prejudice, nationality, gender, politics, religion, race, culture, country of origin. I've only got race there three times because it's an issue. Right? You can't talk about this stuff in business, correct? We've got laws against it in this country for the right reason. But don't kid yourself that people don't make a decision because of your race, your age, your gender, your religion. Not always in your favour. Um, who your company's connected with? I had someone that I described as upper middle class. I haven't heard anybody talk about class in this country in a long time. Um, edict, political correctness, the right suburb. We talked about suburbs here. If you're a lawyer in Sydney, you don't live in Mossman, you're a failure. I don't know what the metaphor is here. I don't know, Meriwether? But I guess the point is, whether you like that or don't like it, think about it for yourself. Why do you make decisions about the car you drive, the suburb you live in, the amount of money you spend on a watch? Because there'll be some of this, I get that. You need to, something to tell the time. <laughs> Seiko, why? Japanese know how to build watches. Cars, I worked for an American group 15 years. There's only two countries in the world that know how to make a car. My opinion. Japanese and Germans, full stop. Not the Austrians, not the Slovenians, not the Americans, not the English, not the French, not the Spanish, right? None of them. Well, they do, they make cars. But not in my prejudiced view of the world. So that is based on manufacturing experience, but it's a straight bigoted prejudice, isn't it? That makes sense? So that's one of them in play. So the job for you now just pick top three. Take a stab at the top three rational drivers. I'm going to give you a big sheet of paper again. Take a stab as a group for this presentation. What are the three drivers, rationally, emotionally, politically, that the judges is motivating the judges? 
This is out of your presentation, your submission. What do you think the drivers are that are going to appeal to the judges? Okay, all right. On to the... So if you just do a quick summary, we've talked about the styles of the judges, the need to gather information about them. And then the next piece is, so what's driving them? What is it that they are looking for? The quick synopsis I've given you is, your documents will have largely been response to a brief. Here's a business case outline. Here's what we've actually included. It will be largely a rational document. The po point about the presentation, it's pretty hard to write emotions into a, ri a written or read document. Much easier to do that when you've got live human beings standing in front of you eyeballing it. That's the whole purpose of the presentation. So the idea is, if that's the case, then what's, why are these judges here? What's driving them? What are their fears? As leaders of enterprises um, around the Hunter and Newcastle, um, do some homework. I can't tell you how long-standing a Novocastria and each of them are. Some of them are, some of them aren't. Some of them are leading enterprises and that's part of why they want to be here. What's the real reason they want to be here and what's the right reason? Is the right reason because they were asked? Absolutely. People are chuffed when they're asked to do something like judging and they also feel like it's incumbent upon them because of the job they do every day. They'll turn up because it's the right thing. They might actually believe in the future of the hunter as well. Just putting it out there. Um, and, and they're the sorts of challenges there that I, th I think that you should, should latch onto. Quick questions on that. Does anybody not get that? Cool. Okay. I'm going to do this in... Um, I think it was um, Aristotle or Socrates, one of those Greek guys, that, um, that said that the only persuasion is self-persuasion. Yeah, the only persuasion is self-persuasion. So we hear words like spin. You hear people say, oh, I don't want to force anybody to do anything. Simple demonstration for you. Presume for a minute that that's a... Um, Magnum 45, powerful, most powerful handgun in the world. Presume. If I come up to Steve and I put that to his head, you might think that that's reasonably persuasive. However, Steve's got a couple of questions to ask himself. How lucky do you feel? No, no, joking. Um, <laughs> firstly, is it a real gun? Secondly, if it's a real gun, is it in fact loaded? If it's a real gun and it's loaded, does Ed know how to use a handgun? If in fact it's loaded and it's a real gun and Ed knows how to use a handgun, is there a possibility that it will misfire and it won't actually fatally wound me? So with those questions answered, he may or may not choose to do what I've asked him. Does that make sense? So what we're going to dive into for a minute here is how do you persuade someone to do something, which is kind of the whole nexus we're talking about, Donald Trump. How the heck, how the heck does he persuade people? Emotionally? Ever heard the expression, the red under the bed? Fear? See, red under the bed came back from the communist days here in, I'm dating myself, the Menzies? Yes? Yeah, the 50s and 60s. Um, and you know, when there was, you know, there was, a, there was a communist party, um, communist party that was uh, re uh, religiously affiliated here in um, in Australia, right? And so to that extent, you sit there and you know, fear, and that's why really, you know, terrific, terrific uh, Australians like Alan Jones and others that just divide, right? They create fear amongst people. That's what they that's what they work in. So the whole idea is. How do you persuade? So we, you've put up a business case. How do you prove that your case is better than anybody else's? That's the job. Everyone's debated at some point. Does the best logic always win? No. So that's the whole premise. Debating is a great example of persuasion. So what we're going to do is we're going to dive through a quick conversation on that and then I'm going to get you to... Um, you might use the term in the engineering space, they talk there about, you talk about case studies, right? 
you might do a hypothetical, you might do a scenario assessment. So it's, it's using that sort of stuff. Let me get on, sorry guys, I'm going to scan through here. Uh, that's for later, sorry. Okay. Okay, you've got a slightly different, yeah, you've got bubbles, correct? Okay, let me just give you a quick um, definition. So a little blue bubble, you got a little uh, uh, shader bubble. A feature, I would suggest the word you should put in there is unique attribute. So a unique attribute of your submission. So what are a couple of the unique attributes of your offer? If we just use one of those, so one of your attributes of your offer might be um, that it connects A and B, whatever the heck A and B are. Otherwise, I'll start giving away elements of each of your submissions. But it connects A and B. And you're pretty sure that's reasonably clever. So then to translate that into a benefit, you might ask the question, so what does that mean to the end user or the client? You heard of WIFM, what is in it for me? This is old sales language that was invented back in about, well, the Americans think they invented selling, but the Chinese were a bit ahead of them by about a couple of thousand years. So what's the benefit? And if you simplistically think about it, people look for one of, count them, three types of benefits. Really simple, make me or save me money. People are looking for a financial benefit. The next one is people look for a temporal, a timing benefit. Save me time or get stuff done faster or make it easier for me to do quickly. And the last one is ego, E-G-O. If you, and I don't mean literally, it is the broadest sense of benefit that connects with your ego. It might be making me look good, making me feel safer, giving me more confidence, um, giving me better prestige. So people will generally look for one of those three types. It's, very, it's a simplification, but is, commercially, is it gonna make me or save me money, make me richer? Is it gonna give me an easier life by saving me time? And is it gonna make me feel better about my lot? So if that's the case, what's evidence? Most people stop there and talk about benefits. How do I convince people that our unique attribute is more, is better than anybody else? Evidence, definition for evidence. Anything that supports your case. If you think about anything that supports your case, if you think about a legal case, a professional witness. Fact, just an opinion. Is an opinion evidence? Absolutely. Does that make sense? Doesn't have to be truth, just someone's opinion. What did this expert motoring critique say? Only two countries in the world that can make cars. That is simply not true, is it? <coughs> so evidence is anything that supports your case. Let me give you five or six different types of evidence because you're going to need to think about how you use these. First one, statistics. Testimonials, case study, not very relevant for you folks at all, hypothetical. Hypothesize what Newcastle might look like if. A visual, theoretically if you had a fly through of what the world would look like with whatever your offer is, right? That image or visual would be pretty compelling. Um, what else have I not covered? Hypothetical. Um, we talked about testimonials. Um, question for you. Who doesn't believe in statistics? Aside from me. Do you do the quote, the Ben Disraeli quote? Lies, damn lies and statistics. I'm mathematically almost autistic. Just accept that for a second. So what does that mean if you're trying to confuse me, use numbers? If you're trying to give me information that I can act upon, don't give me numbers. Does that make sense? 
So if you sat there and wanted to statistically prove and show me the means and the variance, the medians and the modes and all that sort of jazz, I'm gone. I switch off because I can't cope with that information. So the choice, the right stuff, so this is the point is that's the right type of evidence and the right amount. So right type and right amount of evidence for the decision maker. It's almost math, it is almost equational. So if you go back to what we started talking about, the style of the individual, so the analytic, remember? The analytic, the people that are really strong on process, theoretically some of you folks. Have you done your homework, decent process, what were the results, how did you rank or, or sort them, and what's that then tell you in terms of an answer? So those sorts of folks, are they likely to want to see more or less information? Less, less only to the extent, it's, it's a matter of have you, have you done the job? So have you actually developed the data? So to that extent, they want to see process, if that makes sense. Um, and then you'd, you'd have to lay it out in a format that they were used to. <coughs> so the right stuff is the right amount of the right type of evidence to suit the decision maker. So you've got five decision makers there, right? What you're going to need to do is actually understand, is understand the type of evidence you're going to use. You're going to have, what have you got, have you got 30 minutes or 40 minutes to present? 30 minutes, which isn't long. If you talk rubbish, it'll go really fast. But if you just pick one or two examples, um, particularly if you've got more than one, one of you presenting, I would encourage you to actually pick one or two examples or case studies or something around the world which has got a parallel that you might have been part of your research and just use that from several angles. Does that make sense? Rather than introducing lots and lots and lots of new information in 30 minutes. And better still, if it was actually incorporated in your document because then there's alignment between your presentation, document and your presentation. So the whole idea with persuasion is to pick out the relatively unique attributes Identify or understand what that means in terms of the end user, in terms of saving you. Yeah, obviously, most of your propositions are going to be convenient. Most of your propositions are going to save people time. Most of your propositions are going to be around trying to save people money. Right? So that's a good example of how those three drivers occur. Then the point is, how are you going to convince me that team A over team B, because that's what, that's what we're talking about here, competitive tension. How are you going to prove that to me using a case study out of Stockholm or Amsterdam or Chicago, or whatever the heck it is, and get that right so that you've got the right balance of visual versus mathematical imagery, right, in your presentations. Quick questions on persuasion, either definition or how you're going to apply that. So you're talking about in sequence you should be targeting a unique attribute. You don't necessarily know if you've got a unique attribute. That's, that, that's, tr that's true. Um, you've, you've, you've got to pin yourself in, in business, period. You've got, you've, got to, you've got to achieve a point of difference yeah, in, in whatever, whatever your, um, your endeavour. Um, so to that extent, you've probably you kind of got to bet on black or red <laughs> or not bet at all. Um, and it may well be, I, I guess the other thing is there is, is few, few rather than lots. There is an inclination, you know, the, the tasks, the project's complex, so there's lots of stuff you could talk about. The Chinese have an expression which is mama fufu, which means it's all the same to me. So if it's all the same to me, then don't waste the air time. Your precious 30 minutes with that panel, what you say has got to be memorable, it's got to tell a story, if that makes sense. Other quick questions about persuasion. Okay. Five minute task, just brainstorm your couple of features. Um, what do you think the benefit is for the judges and the end users, I guess? And then some of the um, types of evidence you think you're gonna use. Just do a time check. We need to get on a structure. Okay, any quick questions about that persuasion piece before we move on? No, all good? Okay, you've got a blank in front of you. You've also, I think you've also got just the structure piece. Okay, let me, 
this is probably about 10 minutes worth, folks, and then I'm going to get you to go to your breakout rooms and, and the whole structural piece should help you populate using everything we've covered so far. So the whole idea is, remember what I said about structure right at the beginning? Make it easy for you folks. Frankly, forget the audience for a minute. There's five of you, you've been on a long journey together, you need to have your, pardon the French, your shit together on the day. You need to turn up looking like you want to win, looking like you're going to win, and looking like you're the difference between the All Blacks and the Wallabies. <laughs> right? So that this is, the, at, at the very least, this is, a, this is an organisational planning tool for you folks. So I'm going to step through it. Um, I think I've, have I given you the completed piece? Just, yeah, I have. Okay. So I'm just going to explain it as we go. So this is, this is what I'm going to step through explaining it. And then I'm going to go through the delivery piece and then how you use it planning. Because just like you would write a letter, if you wrote a letter, would you start out with the words, dear mum or dad? You would, but before that, hopefully there would have been a little bit of thought that went into why you're writing the letter and what you're trying to achieve. Send money, right? <laughs> so the premise is that the opening comments for the first five, six, ten seconds, maybe half a minute, no one is listening to anything you say like a really high-speed camera. They are checking you out. Age, interested, know their game, don't know their game, want to be here, care, don't care, likeable, smiling, happy, stressed, healthy, sick. All of those things. Not a check sheet, but that's what's going on. The other thing is you will invariably have been sitting outside. How is that functioning as you start? Rubbish. It's a muscle. It's not working, is it? <coughs> so you need to get it tuned up like an athlete, right? Generally, the sort of stuff you'll put in there is time, questions, right? It's, it's housekeep stuff. Good morning. We're going to speak for 30 minutes. We're team blah. <coughs> then on to the creative. It is the last step in planning because you're not supposed to be a stand-up comedy. That's not what you're there for. The point about a creative is something, I used that clip this morning, uh, this afternoon, that was my creative. At the end of that, was any of you unclear about the fact that we were going to work on the emotion of the story? Does that make sense? So something like that if it's relevant, if you've got it. Right now, don't, if you don't have one, or nothing comes to mind, don't set about doing that. You've got much more, uh, much more important stuff to do. That's why it's optional. A statement up front, reasonably swiftly, about why you are here today for this audience. Today, we'd like to do X. Then you headline your argument. What's the first section we're going to cover, the second section and the third section? And people say, doesn't it become a bit mechanical when you've got threes? Why do we go A, B, C and not A, B, C, D? Why do we go 1, 2, 3 and not 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5? Right? Part of it's memory span, retention, pattern. So I would encourage you to cut it into three agendas or less. And if you can't, and you say to me, Ed, I've got six agendas, I would say to you, you have not stopped and thought about your audience and your objective and what you're trying to communicate. And you only have 30 minutes. Then sitting under each of those headings is body one, body two, body three. That is the substance under each of those. So as you can see, if you're planning this, you just put down a couple of dot points, maybe in sequence, that, that sits under. I'll give you an example in a minute. Summary. If you've got a 30 minute presentation, from the beginning to there, let's say that's 25 minutes. Let's say your wrap up's five minutes. They've forgotten half of what you said there. So if you think about it, beginning of the message, middle of the message, end of the message. So what you do is a mini summary of that, followed by a mini summary of that, followed by a mini summary of that and then your conclusion and your next step. Okay, so that's what goes in those boxes. 
let me show you now how it how we build it. So the very first, you don't fill in the top box of your opening or your creative. The first thing you define is how do I want to describe my subject or my topic? So the numbers represent your planning sequence, if that makes sense. And if you've ever heard the expression you start with the end in mind, if that's your objective, what's my conclusion? So these numbers are laid out on that completed format, but it's just as it steps through. No, it's not. Sorry, guys. My apologies. Um, so once you've decided your subject and your conclusion, this is the chess piece. This is a strategy piece. What do I cover first, second, and third? And the whole premise with this is you look at them, they look like three equal portions of time, don't they? So theoretically, if you started with this one, you might go, first thing we're going to do is talk about the highlights of our bid. Now, what might have happened is they might actually have read the document. But let's say you're number five. Have they forgotten your document? Pretty much. But do you reckon it's worth a third of your argument? Maybe not. What do we talk about persuasion? You've already told them about your offer. So you might decide to allocate those proportionally or you might not. And tonight, today, if I could get you to those three agendas, having sorted them out in your own words, that'd be a re if you, if, unless you're further advanced than that, that'd be a really good piece of prep for next week. So then, that body is the detail that sits under headline one. That body there sits under agenda two and that body sits under agenda three. The words there are link. So you have to be able to link body one to body two to body three to tell a story. You then have your mini summaries. Then you craft your opening comments, so that's number six. This is the way you write it. And the last thing you finish up with is your creative. Because I guarantee you, you've got a business message there. If you do all but that, you'll put it to bed and then you'll be sitting there watching a stupid TV clip about something and you'll go, bang, that's the essence of what we're talking about. Or you'll see a video. That's how, you remember I did the um, thing on the car industry? We're talking about strategy. The whole car, that's the way the car thing came about. I'd, the next day I saw one of these other parts of the Bleeding Heart Club about the car manufacturing industry in Australia. And I thought, bingo, I did some quick research and came up with that irritating English bloke. But my point is I had, I had my context set. I was just looking for something contemporary. Okay, so that's the way... <coughs> Let me just leave it there. So that's the way we build it. So the flow, which I haven't arrowed in. So if you're delivering this, opening comments, creative, subject, agenda one, agenda two, agenda three, down to your body, one, two, three, summary, one, two, three, and conclusion. Let me now give you a two minute demonstration then I'll get you to do some planning. Thank you. Just before I turned up here this afternoon, I was um, sitting right, right by Wickham Railway Station looking at um, a property. What I'd like you to do is tell you about why I'm so keen about buying a property in Newcastle. First thing I want to talk to you about is um, why Newcastle? Um, why now? And the future. So why Newcastle? Um, Entry point, half of what you buy, something similar in Sydney. Um, I can just see immense growth here. Um, the beaches, the lifestyle, whether it's for me or the next generation, doesn't matter. Um, and probably I'm spending a bit of time up here, so I've probably fooled myself that I think I've got half a clue about what's going on. Um, why now? Um, probably another five, six, seven years of work, superannuation. Um, hate stockbrokers, hate the equity market. Mathematically, not interested in following shared trends. Stockbrokers are liars. You get the drift. Um, and um, the future, um, I sort of place we're looking for is probably somewhere I could, uh, when I'm finally done and busted in Sydney, I could uh, see myself getting up each day and just surfing over at, uh, at Newey. Um, so, uh, why Newcastle? Because of the future. Uh, why now? 
because it makes a lot of sense and it's the right time in life and I'm spending a fair bit of time up here. And the future, you know, I could, could see myself living here really happily. Conclusions and next steps. I reckon I'll probably buy a property in the next six months here. Right, so a really, really simple way to both plan it and it's more important because I, I could start and stop where I wanted to because there's only one of me. You've got a choreographing piece to do. Does that make sense? Last thing I'll leave you with is just some tips. You've got most of you, have any of you got six in your team? Yep, okay, so you've got a couple, yeah, you've got a couple of sixes. So the question is, if there's literally, and I, I wasn't sure of it, if there's literally an instruction to, if for everyone to present, you, you have, need to think about that, right? Everyone stands up at the front and then sits down. Serious? Um, there's nothing wrong with, I, I talk about cameo, right? So let's say you're at a table. Um, I might ask one or two of my team members to make a comment as they sit at the table about a particular element of your offer. So not everyone needs to monkey up, monkey down sort of routine. So the, the other thing is that in terms of cohesion and smoothness, just um, looking, not slick, but looking cohesive, um, you can often get someone to do all of that. I mean, that piece for me was about 30 seconds, right? And I would suggest that you probably don't want to make it much more than that. Get, get, get going, particularly if you're third, fourth or fifth. They've seen two presentations already, which they've probably promptly forgotten. I, I sound cynical, but think about, you know, it's like when you're doing uni. By the time you get to fifth hour, it's, it's sitting through these presentations is like doing a four or five hour exam. Um, so empathise with the judges, tip. Um, then easily divide those up. You know, you might, if that is reasonably brief and it's a synopsis of your bid, and I'm not suggesting everyone should do that, but if that's reasonably compact, just get one person to do it reasonably crisply. Then you might actually almost have an interactive piece there where you might actually include a couple of people. And then you could similarly get someone to do the wrap up. They talk about top and tail, so getting someone to do the top and the tail. Um, other tip for you, yeah, look, if you've got someone that's naturally strong as a presenter, use them. But it's not about rock stars. If you did the finance section, theoretically, or you did the, the urban section, or you did the technology section, and maybe you're not the world's best communicator or presenter, it doesn't matter. The, from a leadership standpoint, the audience, and I can tell you this is true in commerce as well, they are going to want to see people who have got subject matter expertise show, which show and, and involve themselves. And unfortunately, this happens to be a leadership course. So if that's the case, then you probably should work out getting better at doing that piece. Does that make sense? Some of you will be naturally okay with this. Some of you will hate this. I get that. That's pretty normal. Um, so that's the structure piece. I've gone through it really quickly. Questions? If you think about it simplistically, you all got the same brief. How you interpreted the problem? You know, clients, client land 101. No two people will look at the problem the same way. You'll hear a client say, you, you provided me insight. So the way you folks interpret that, that opportunity or the, the, the brief, I think it's actually, that's, that's quite worthy of, of, of conversation. Because the five of you will have, in, I can tell you categorically, the five of you interpreted the, the question, there was some quite, quite, some quite um, not convergent, divergent, divergent interpretations. Yeah, absolutely. Other quick questions? That logic should help most of you for the sort of the right, the right brainers of us that need process logic and structure should actually enable you to plan together. So what I'm going to do is, um, prob given it's 20 to 6 now, um, I think the idea was we've got break rooms. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a, a blank one of those. Um, and what I would suggest you do is, even if you retro, frankly, retrofitting, or just humour <coughs> humor yourselves on laying out the structure, um, or just progress your presentation if it's more advanced than this stuff, because I'm sure that's, that's the... Um, the, the case in some instances.